Nothing compares to the simple pleasure of a bike ride. Nothing, nothing, nothing compares. And that is a terrible scene for us. These legs, attached to pro cyclist Pavel Polyansky, 16 stages into the Tour de France, are a glimpse of what the body endures at the most watched sports event in the world. This is actually a sign of good fitness, his blood vessels are dilating to help with oxygen flow. And he needs all the help he can get, because the Tour de France is no joke. Stretching 3,350 kilometers over 24 days, riders burn up to 8,000 calories every single day. That's more than three times what pro runners burn in a marathon. For the brave cyclist, peak fitness is a professional requirement. And beyond that, pain is par for the course. But there's been a crash there, Garrett has gone down on the line. That kind of extreme pressure is why doping, the illegal use of performance enhancing drugs, is so prevalent in the race. If athletes at their pinnacle use drugs to perform, imagine what the Tour de France would do to the average body. They pick the hardest and the most dangerous and the longest distances that they could possibly can for a Grand Tour. And it's part of the whole identity of the Tour de France. Let's see how hard we can make it. Let's talk about what really happens to your body in the legendary Tour de France. If you're an enthusiast and you're a cycling uh, buff, you know, you might do one of those stages. I mean, there's no way that, you know, the average person, even of good athletic ability, is going to be able to complete a Tour de France. Hey, Eric, you were on those other videos about ski jumping in Doubles Luge. What do you know about the Tour de France? Well, I've been modeling the Tour de France since 2003. So the idea was to take terrain data that's available each year for the various stages and see if we can come up with a, a pretty good estimate for the winner. We've done pretty well over the years. Now, to give you an idea of what the body goes through in these three weeks of hell, let's go week by week. It's day one of week one, and around 25 million viewers are tuning in to watch you take off on the open road from Copenhagen. If you're fit enough, your resting heart rate might be as low as 40 BPM, next to the average person's at 60 to 100. If your four-time winner, Chris Froome, you're somehow doing 29 BPM. Your heart rate is gonna vary dramatically, but the goal is to maintain the same body weight throughout. And considering how many calories you're burning, that's easier said than done. In the course of a given stage, their average burn might be something like 5,500 calories. Well, a 550 calorie Big Mac, that's 10 of them. Of course, they're not gonna eat, consume 10 Big Macs, but that's the amount of food energy that they're burning each stage, and they have to match that. If you're the winner, you'll likely get through the equivalent of 210 Big Macs throughout the event, 118,000 calories. In this first week, you're burning about three to 5% of your protein stores, your fuel, to keep up with the pack. The usual catabolism is in effect. Catabolism is a breakdown of tissue, really, and fueling. So when you start pedaling, you get into a catabolic state. So your heart rate goes up, you increase blood flow to the muscle, it gets into the muscle, causes the body to break down, glucose, glycogen, and then fatty acids. And that's all part of the normal exercise response. The idea is to start repairing tissue. And if they're not eating close to the end of exercise, then they get into a whole muscle wasting because the body's like, I need amino acids. What's the first thing to go is muscle tissue because it's very active and very energy hungry. The body's like, I need something here. And if you're not gonna get it to me, I'm gonna make you stop. So essentially, catabolism is like that alien plant uh, Audrey 2 in Little Shop of Horrors. Does it have to be human? Does it have to be mine? If you can't keep it fed, it's gonna eat away at you. That is when you start bonking. More on that later. We're on week two now, and somehow you're fitter than you were when you started, but you're heading into the mountains now, and those climbs are unforgiving. Obviously, it's a stressful time sending your cortisol levels, the stress hormone, way up. Plenty of sleep between days will help immensely. If not, you guessed it, the bonk takes over. I'll get to it. As you tear through the root, you're also tearing through red blood cells. And red blood cells carry oxygen. Like the folks watching at home, you're destroying 2 million red blood cells every second. But while the average person will have no problem replacing theirs, you're using more oxygen than your system can keep up with. This puts you at risk of lower immunity and anemia. Translation, 
sick and tired. So you're onto your second week and your maximum heart rate while racing may have been up with Chris Froome's at 174 BPM in the first week. By now it might be slowing, growing weaker from all the hard work. Thankfully your first of two official rest days comes 11 days in, just in time to hear the mountain ahead beckoning. It's 2022 and your highest climb this year waiting for you at the 11th stage is the dreaded Col du Galibier at 2,642 meters above sea level. Climbing this hill, it looks like you're breaking down more muscle than you're able to build up. This is where your muscles are really put to the test. Tearing through muscle tissue, burning all your diminished fat mass. Congratulations, you're bonking. So there's actually two ways, right? We have a dehydration and we have a low fueling. When you are low from hypoglycemia and low fueling, it's like this tunnel vision and you're right on the edge of feeling like you're gonna hit a wall where you'll see someone and they're starting to drift off the back. I think in fact Armstrong has absolutely hit the wall. And then they eat and then all of a sudden, boom, they can go. Like 20 minutes later, they, they're fine. But people who are dehydrated, they'll drift off the back and you get really angry because you have a lot of aldosterone that's coming out and aldosterone induces aggression and anger. Like in 2010 when Australian Cadell Evans ran out of steam on stage 9 after dominating the race up to that point. Cadell Evans is cracked in the yellow jersey here. You can see it here too on this pomme de terre camera. The Spanish Miguel Enderain, winner of the last five tours, struggling and desperate for hydration. This is a sign of a man suffering like we'd never seen before. He's calling for a drink but he can't take a drink. If he gets a drink he gets penalised. The penalty is for the last 20 kilometers of the stage when riders are too packed together for their teams to supply them. You reach your second rest day just after the tame flat at the 15th stage. From stages 19 to 21, just be relieved to bid the Pyrenees adieu, heading full speed for the glorious Champs-Élysées finish. As you revel in your victory over this year's route, don't stay off the bike for too long, or even sitting still can cause damage. It tends to be the result of injuries, repetitive motion, excessive stress, or the ingredients that make up the Tour de France. As your muscle tissue repairs itself, mounds of collagen on your muscles develop scar tissue. You'll feel so tense, it'll be as if you're injured out of nowhere. In years to come, you'll look back fondly in your endurance cycling career, reaping all those health benefits. Yeah, I don't think there are any benefits. Oh. Really, I don't. Oh. Because you think about the extremity of what they've put their bodies through for so many years. And from an exercise and health perspective, it's far beyond and above anything that the body should really go through. We see a lot of cardiac problems, see a lot of gut distress, a lot of mental angst, all these repercussions from a health standpoint of putting their body through the ringer for so many years in a row. Not to mention the osteoporosis from low bone density after years of sweating out all that useful calcium. Unfortunately, the research from retired Tour de France cyclists is muddied a little thanks to three notorious words. Performance enhancing drugs. The cigarettes and the methamphetamines that they would have on the corner before they have to do a big hill climb. Like drugs have always been part of it. The drug most commonly used by athletes is enthropertine. Uh, enthro erythropoietin. <laughs> erythropoietin, or EPO. Remember that when competing almost every day for weeks, a cyclist can struggle to produce enough red blood cells. EPOs help to produce more, increasing oxygen, and as a result, performance. But EPO can thicken your blood, some call it sticky blood, over time risking heart disease, strokes, all kinds of life-threatening side effects. And it's endemic in almost every sport, but cycling really got caught because you would see guys that would never have a bad day. Famously, Lance Armstrong won every Tour de France between 1999 and 2005 before being stripped of his titles for doping in 2012. But in that same time period, 87% of those placed in the top 10 were also confirmed or suspected of doping. It was a culture then. But right. I find the racing more interesting now because people have bad days. But Stacy, is it- Is it still there? Definitely. How is it being caught? It's not. A report from the Cycling Independent Report Commission showed anywhere from 20 to 90% of riders doing it in the present day. Eric, 
Why is that? why is there doping? Well, I think the Tour de France is in the top three of the most grueling sporting events. That- a lot of the younger guys. It's right. the guys that are starting to question, like, what are you giving me, and why are you giving me this? It's no secret that cycling has has been through a very dark period in in, in the last decade, but that the sport has changed, and it's it, of course questions need to be asked. That's that's normal but it should no longer be met with the same kind of hostility that it has been in the past. Whether you're blazing ahead or way at the back, the best way to endure the physical pain and pressure of the Tour de France is to embrace it. Mentally, they are like ironclad. They get on the bike and they're just like focused. Greg Henderson is one of my good friends. I've known him forever. I've talked to him since he's retired and I'm like, what was that mental state? He's like, you know what, Stace, you get on the bike and you don't even see anything. You don't feel anything. All you do is you look and you see where the guy is in front of you and you want to move forward. This all goes to show the incredible feats the human body and mind can achieve for glory, $500,000 and the iconic yellow jersey. If you've ever pondered the physical limits of the human body beyond uh, throwing someone in a black hole, it doesn't get more extreme than the Tour de France. If I were you, I wouldn't try it at home. But if you do, set your peloton to what the fuck.